In this part two of the three-part series on six, or is that seven new critical terms put forward as a way of talking more productively about the relations of architecture to psychoanalysis, we tackle the difficult issue of conatus. This is an idea that has been around since ancient classical philosophers talked about change in duration, and presumably before that, shamans were talking about our ability to switch identities with animals, plants, and stones. Basically, conatus is what makes us believe that we are the same person when we wake up every morning, or how we conceive our free will, our accomplishment, and our resulting reactions of disappointment or satisfaction. Conatus also has a geometric side, where it is the point with no dimensions, yet capable of and intrinsic to all extension. It's both a part of space and not a part, and putting the geometric aspect of Conatus together with its identification aspects is no easy matter. This is why we dodge the difficult questions and turn to a case of architecture, albeit a fictional case, where the presence of Conatus is not in doubt. The Tower of Babel, shown here in a painting by Peter Bruegel. This famous painting gives us one version of what happens at the top, showing the construction project as nearly finished, with scaffolding in place and workers busy on the last few stories. Other sources, such as the famous one in Genesis, say that the top is destroyed. A third view has it that the top is invisible from below. This is a popular option that comes out of the ancient tradition where the line separating heaven and earth is a case of isomeric division. The top can't be seen because those below don't have the proper clearance. Taking all three options together makes the Tower of Babel a virtual encyclopedia of new critical terminology. But what do these variations say about Conatus? If anything, they say that Conatus is like a rail terminal where many lines come under one roof, discharge their passengers, collect new ones, and then set off for parts unknown, or rather, all too well known. We will take several of these departing trains to avoid being delayed by the historical baggage that we get for this term by thinking it belongs to any one school of thought. Rather, we will stick to our visual analogy, the Tower of Babel, and ask how it could be structured so that so many meanings can be accommodated and so many theories allowed to coexist. The biblical version asserts tacitly that the tower was used by the Assyrians and Babylonians to facilitate the king's contact with gods, or more likely, goddesses. Babel referred to a town with a tower, and the Assyrian Babel, or Gate of God, was replaced with a Hebrew pun for meaningless language, Babel. The story hinges around the linguistic moment when God replaced a single human language, called Adamic, because Adam used it to create the material world by naming it, with multiple tongues, giving rise to intercultural confusion. If we take the architectural analogy seriously, it tells us a lot about this hypothetical Adamic speech. The tower was both a continuous spiral and a series of stepped platforms from a broad material base to a hypothetical dimensionless point at top, like the precious jewel that Egyptian pyramids were said to display at their pinnacle. To use a technical terminology, Adamic speech applies what is called bi-univocal concordance. In other words, the signifier designates a signified fully, point by point. This one-to-one -one correspondence leaves nothing out so that like a step in a physical staircase, for every step forward, there is a step up. The materiality of the horizontal tread gives rise to a vertical lift, a connection of the sound with the abstract dimensionless idea. Put a bunch of steps together and you connect heaven to earth, base materiality with the most ideal thing you can imagine, which is conatus. 
If we turn to step 90 degrees to see the temporal function, moving from left to right rather than bottom to top, we can represent the step as two vectors where the vector pointing to the earth can be folded under or into the vector moving thought forward. We have encountered folding like this in the Theseian labyrinth discussed in part one and learned that its perfect correspondence had to do with bidirectionality, making the seven folds into 14. God found this horrifying because with a one-to-one -one relation between signifiers and signifieds, humans would be able to reach the conatus that God had reserved for himself, a dimensionless point concentrating all power and all mind. The only thing God could do was to limit the correspondence by throwing in an indefinite gap between the signifier and the signified, where the one of signification falls short of its objective. This way, the latter would fail to reach the top. Dimensions would never be allowed to shrink to nothing and at the same time be all-powerful. But this is not the end of the story. The gap itself between the number one as an idea and the one as a representation gives rise to some funny properties that complicate the idea of the limit we draw between the bottom and the top of the tower. A mathematical analogy uses a series by which we divide numbers 1 through 9 by 9. In each case, we get an endless series, 0 0.222, 0 0.333, 0 0.444, and so on. But if we follow the protocol, we end up having to write 9 over 9 as 0 0.99999, etc., even though 9 divided by 9 is clearly 1. Stuff like this happens a lot with the number 9, and there's a book by Cecil Balmond that gets into it. But here we only need to remember that the 9 is the point where the base 10 number system has to start over, the point where new levels are added, tens, then hundreds, then a thousands, and so on. The remainder of subtracting 0.9999, etc. from 1 gives you an idea of the infinitesimal remainder, the little bit of nothing that gets between what we intend to say and what we come out saying, which sometimes is more than we meant to say. This sounds absurd, of course, but we can see this in any Escher drawing of staircases that goes simultaneously up and down. The idea is that the cut, the small surplus or lack that we can never get rid of because we have lost our ability to speak Adam's tongue, means that in our Euclidean world, there is always the element of paradox. The boundary between the lower part of the Tower of Babel and the top cannot be removed or transgressed. Rather, the cut will be the thing that gives human subjectivity its common core. The fact that the world we live in will always be radically uncanny. This reverses the usual way of talking about everyday appearances as normal. The uncanny always appears as an exception, a rare freak occurrence. But the truth of the matter is that the everyday is never without the exceptions that create a fuzzy edge or hole in the middle. They are signs of the finitude of the everyday, the impossibility of perfection, the persistence of doubt, and the inevitability of confusion. In other words, the abnormal is not just the new normal, it's been normal since Babel was built, or rather, non-built. Here's where architecture comes in with an unexpected twist to the plot. The Tower of Babel is not just a staircase, it's a spiral staircase. It's both a circular continuum and a series of tread and riser conditions. The gap in the signifier-signified relationship gives us a new structure, a structure based on the logic of the gap. The gap transforms Adamic speeches in dexical one-to-one effectiveness into languages unavoidable mismatches between what we say and what we meant to say. The break occurs along a fracture line, separating what is intended and what is the necessary baggage of every signifier, which can be jettisoned or hijacked 
for totally unrelated purposes. The shortfall in the signifier-signified angle becomes a wedge inserting into what, in Adamic language, would be a closed circle. This opening allows the signifier to attach to other signifiers in a chain, with links that can wander far away from the original meaning. This wandering effect is thanks to the split, and the split happens in a special way we call metonymy. Here is how language uses a shortcoming to advantage. Without the break in the signifier that is metonymy, there would be no void that could allow a signifier to be linked to another, and then another, to form a chain. Just think of it. Chains create associations. Associations are about speculation. This could be just blah, 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 or the kind of mental wandering that creates new ideas. Without signifying chains of metonymical signifiers, thought would only grind down to its prior expectations, saying and thinking nothing new. From the architectural example of the Tower of Babel, we have discovered the structural principle of idea formation. The Tower of Babel is the idea that you can use earth to touch and even penetrate the sky. The wedge defines what it tries to invade. That's the logic of the catagraphic mark and the isomeric boundary it defines. The wedge attacks Conatus, but in the process, Conatus recharges the material below with the capacity to create infinitely chained melodies. How bizarre! Conatus is created out of the salt from below, so we might say that the catagraphic attack constructs the target it aims at, and that this region above the material lower part of the tower is idealized as another, and given imaginary powers presumed by the structure of the steps that spiral to a vanishing point. Of course, the point is that the point is never reached. Conatus is always beyond the limit. We deal with the catagraphic cut and the isomeric line, which is either a line of incompletion, the bottom edge of the destroyed top, or a permanent zone of invisibility. All three aspects of the other we create in our attempts to connect to meaning by means of material signs, and in all representations of this project, this space of the other is something that looks back, watches over us, regulates us with its gaze. This is what happens with the ichnographic drawing whose orthographic face presents itself to the heavens as something to be seen by a celestial eye, not at any one angle, but equally distributed across the dome of blue or black. I like to use Lacan's term for the other, the capital A, because it's a wedge that's crossed, but to emphasize that the cross is a matter of limitations we place on something that we made ourselves, I like to follow Lacan again by crossing it again, just to make sure we understand that we know this space only by our lack of access, our inability to understand, the errors of transmission that lead to countless fake or faulty representations of what is up there. We can't begin to count all of the gods and demons that humans have imagined to populate the region above the isomeric line that cuts off the top of the Tower of Babel. Don't forget the figure of justice, or justitia, whose head is invisible because it's in direct contact with the divinity beyond. Once we have grasped the shape, or rather structure, of this mysterious space of the other, we can see how our terms come to terms with examples we might never connect to the Tower of Babel. My first and favorite examples are Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, where adolescent Alice makes catagraphic cuts in an appropriately Lacanian place, that is, a mirror. The key here is to note that Alice never actually gets to the other side. She is trapped in what could be called the tain of the mirror, the mirror's backing. She is inside the isomeric space, which reverses everything, 
although the sitting room as a whole seems at first familiar. Alice's mirror gives us a blueprint for how the catagraphic cut provides an interior for travel that generates its own virtual beyond where the other, the capital A, is always out of reach but present as an empty command, a tyrant who pulls the strings from behind the scenes, like the famous wizard in The Wizard of Oz, where a runaway girl dreams that she has traveled to a magical land, just like Alice. From inside the mirror, the reversed image is converted to reversibility itself and repackaged in a variety of situations. The fact of being inside the mirror is suppressed, but reversibility becomes the key to the chains of signifiers that charge Alice's journey. In ordinary life, we remain trapped by the image we have of ourselves in the mirror. The paradox is that we are the only one who can see this image correctly, orthographically, yet it conditions all of our experiences as a person in public. We remain trapped in the mirror, subject to the whims of the tyrannical big other, the autre, the a, imagining that there is an inaccessible place of power. This gives us an introduction to the role played by Cathetus. It lets us see Conatus, but it prevents us from getting there. We only have to think about it to bring our own personal trap into existence, like Daphne and the story of Apollo and Daphne. Our paralysis is our Cathetus relation to the vanishing point that seems to follow us around, but which, in 3D space at least, we never reach, thanks to the catagraphic cut and its isomeric barrier. We can confirm this personal situation because history has preserved it in micro detail. The hero, such as Hercules shown here, is caught in a roundabout, this particular one being named Okeanos, the ocean, being thought to be the margin of the visible world. Same as Alice's mirror. The circle's center is also the vanishing point at the top of the pyramid, meaning that space has turned inside out. Okeanos could just as easily be a literal picture of the pomerium, the hollow space inside the city's double wall used for ritual repair of the wall's magical properties. In Rome's legal code, Rome existed only in this thin space. Everything else, both on the inside and outside of the walls, was regarded as just a territory. So when we use the term city of Rome, we really mean a Taurus. The term pomerium is a contraction of post murum, and the Tower of Babel tells us the story, that it was made inside the catagraphic cut, that the power of the big other was projected as an inaccessible space beyond, but this projection was made from both sides, so the result was a circular double ring, charged by the radical absence of the other. Guess who? This ethnographical evidence confirms the connection between the catagraphic cut, isomerics, conatus, and cathedus as the line paralyzing the occupants of the thin space by religious and legal obligations. Everything the Theseian labyrinth might imply. How funny that the actor who plays a private investigator hired to spy on a couple would be named Gene Hackman. Anyway, in the 1974 film, The Conversation, Hackman is shown in one scene crouching behind a toilet in a motel room next to the couples with his eavesdropping equipment. The toilet, however, magically becomes a boca della verita, a mouth of truth, but it's talking generally about the secret of all such liminal boundaries and their relation to the terrifying big other as simultaneously inaccessible but overpresent. We count on toilets being a one-way device, always down and out, hopefully, so that when they back up, they bring back our fears about the double directionality of the labyrinth meanders and how they are supposed to work as a seven but surprise us as fourteen. 
In projective geometry, this is called non-orientation, and Hackman's confinement in this small space repeats the theme of the pomerium as a place of paralysis. For the cosmic liminal margin, there is typically an angel doorkeeper, a being able to walk on earth or fly in the heavens. And the ray of light that penetrates the architectural wall connects to the point that binds the structure of the pyramid geometrically to the mortal world below. In paintings of the Annunciation, we see the cathetus line painted literally, connecting the sacred zero-dimension point of Conatus with the materia, the material ground, of Mary. Conatus is a literal version of Freud's saying, Psyche is extended. We could say, without changing the meaning, that Psyche, also known as God, is extension, and note that the line ends at Mary's ear, where the word impregnates this acoustic womb. There is even a name for this kind of auditory sexual act, acousmatic. The Irish author James Joyce adds another level of meaning with his collection of overheard snatches of conversations he called epiphanies. He wrote down hundreds of these during his walks around town and travels. Of course, they were not important for the people who were actually having the conversations, just as the couple spied on by Gene Hackman were just talking to each other, unaware that what they said had any importance to a mysterious invisible third party. They only became epiphanies thanks to this act of theft by being brought into a thin space where seven becomes 14 because a double meaning has been found in the blah, blah, blah of ordinary conversation. We must remember that every signifier is something spoken and something heard, a Janus construction. Joyce heard what the speakers themselves did not intend to say, or maybe they did, but only unconsciously. A series of metonymic chains where a code would thread its way through unsuspecting signifiers. The more ordinary the talk, the greater the epiphany value. That's how it works when psyche extends itself, and when enunciations arrive at their proper destination. This is why Babel was both Babel in the sense of blah, 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 and the gate of heaven. James Joyce's epiphany relation to the Christian event of Annunciation and the general linguistic associations of the Tower of Babel draw together the ideas of the catagraph, isomeric design, and conatus into a sonic formula that is used in psychoanalysis to privilege the ear as the organ of discovery. Discovery of what? The aim of analysis is to give the unconscious a chance to speak. If the psychoanalysis is only an ear, the unconscious is only a voice, or as the poet Horace said about the tiny bird, the nightingale, that it was a voice and nothing more. A disembodied voice hovers above the clouds of the embodied pyramid. But now we have a model that suggests that the catagraph and isomer lines are about the portal between the psyche's extension below, its blah, 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 and the conatus of the unconscious above, the dimensionless point. We should take comfort in the fact that others before us, such as Dürer, have realized these terms in different ways, but always recognized and used the same internal dynamics. It's also evident that the six or seven terms have a graphic or rebus aspect, in Dürer's famous emblem-like presentation of melancholy, shown here appropriately as an angel seated in the traditional pose of melancholy with elbow on the knee, there is a self-referencing matrix of numbers that makes us think of the Fibonacci series of golden numbers. There's also a ladder to make us think of the scala or steps to Parnassus, and scales that we find justitia holding when her head is lost in the clouds. There's the form of a cube caught halfway moving through a 2D surface. And there's a sphere to show us the featureless surface of projective space. There's even a bell to wake the dead to resurrection and a timer to say when that resurrection will take place. 
But there is a way to test all of these conjectural ersatz decodings, and that's the way Dewar intentionally misspelled the word melancholia. We know it wasn't an accident, because elsewhere Dewar gets the spelling right. So the E instead of the A must have had a reason. Clever trickster that he was, Dürer wanted to make an anagram out of melancholia to say that this traditional line between life and death opens a portal to grief, and that portal is called the limen cella, the gate of heaven. It doesn't hurt that the etymology of this word cella is what is called a contronym, that is, one word with two opposite meanings. This makes heaven also the wedge that breaks into heavenly space, and also like the burin that an engraver such as Dürer uses to show us that break-in. In Claude Bragdon's illustration of the hypercube, we get a picture of immersion that puts the relation of projective geometry forms to Euclidean solids in a slightly different way. Thanks to the sequence view of cubes falling, we are able to add another of our six or seven points to the list, that of transients. Bragdon lets us say that the profiles of the cube that go from a point to a triangle, then a pentagon, then a hexagon, and back again to a point, reversing the sequence, is despite all these changes, still a cube. The cube doesn't change. It's just the fall of the cube through a surface that produces what we perceive as change. Transience is the nature of our experience, but conatus is the unchanging basis for those changes. Now we have five terms, the categraphic and isomeric cut, things we find in history, theology, and ethnography, adding the idea of conatus and transience, all under the heading of anamorphosis the idea that within appearances there is something hidden that is related to paralysis. We even have a new idea of what paralysis involves when we understand conatus as a point of structural fixity, which, like the unconscious, binds our blah blah blah, where true and false, good and evil, life and death, alternate like the positions on Fortuna's wheel. This all versus what we might call the truth of truth, which is the unconscious as psyche, that knows nothing about the blah blah blah, but uses it as a cloak of darkness, disguising itself in our everyday speech, our babble. Our babble is Babel, the gate of the psychic heaven, the unconscious. Now it begins to make sense why an isomeric catagraph can connect to conatus with a cathetic line. We see the line in paintings. We at least see a ring around conatus when saints and heavenly gates have halos. And we understand why seven must also be the 14 as the number of infinity. Are these connected to the idea of tessera, the token broken into two parts by parting friends? Most people would say that a mirror image is a reflection, but this is not technically true. A mirror surface cuts the visual plane so that the visual image is split between a right and left-hand version. This is called chirality, and it's the reason that mirrors reverse left and right, but not top and bottom. The mirror stage is the mirror stage because we identify with a spectral double we see in the mirror and think of it as a twin who is always with us, but always at a distance, always trapped. Our twin, like Remus and other famous dead twins, thanks to the fact that it always looked better than us, tempts us to think that we are the dead one and that it is alive and well. This is chorality in terms of the belief that the thing that can be seen must always be alive. The thing that we can't see, namely ourselves, is really the left-handed version, the sinister Mr. Hyde to the mirror's Dr. Jekyll. The superiority of our spectral twin, which will be with us until death, 
can finally end our lifelong court-ordered restraining order. This is our portable trap. We can see it clearly when the mirror happens to mirror itself, as in the lost in the funhouse scene that Charlie Chaplin perfected in the movie The Circus, and Orson Welles copied 10 years later, 1947, in Lady from Shanghai. The splitting of the psyche into prismatic duplicates is accentuated in cases of ascesis, or flight. Charlie runs from the policeman, and Elsa runs from Michael. Or Juliet runs from Romeo in Shakespeare. Or Francesca runs from Paolo in Dante. The point is that fracturing and multiplication is the key to all extensions in space that are about chasing and flight, a motion that is born from the non-orientability of love and hate. Dramatists have known this since prehistoric times when shamans were telling the tales. The Funhouse Mirror shows that the splitting theme of the double, or twin, is not just about the way the one cut results in two faces, but the way the one cut is simultaneously an infinity of cuts with two faces. Remember that metonymy is the signifier with two faces, both looking inward. This is what Lacan said about the unary trait, namely that it's infinite, and then he relates it to the golden ratio to show that it can be modeled as mathematical recursion, as the one entering into itself as an alternating current turning the lights on and off between containing and enumerating, or indicating and representing. This regress of ones over ones is what Lacan calls the unary trait, and its key is how a trap is generated simply by the desire to escape. This is not just a clue to the story of Daphne and Apollo, with its famous paralysis of Daphne into a laurel tree, it also explains how the Theseian labyrinth is a trap thanks to the doubling of its single corridor into the functions of entry and exit, which fold over each other. Daphne's desire, the aspect of Conatus as a will or desire, combines with the idea of Conatus as a fixed point, like a vanishing point. Cathetus, at a right angle to the catagraphic cut, is Apollo's pursuit, the same model as the Tower of Babel. But if we trace the story back to the original theme of revenge, where Eros, to get back at Apollo for insulting him, fashions an arrow with two points that shoots simultaneously in two directions, love and hate, we have proof that much of mythology is written in the same key as projective geometry. This is not as complicated as it might sound since there is a way to see the creation of this trap out of the two-dimensional space of the escape that traps itself as a fold of space. We could call this the Janus fold. We usually get the god Janus as a head with two faces, but it might be possible to say that it had a prior condition. When the two faces faced or mirrored each other, an inner view, but then they passed through each other to create an outward, panoramic view. From face to face, to a panoptical center, seems to go back to our idea of Conatus, with the all-seeing eye at the top of the pyramid. If we see the fold as the structure of this eye, things get even more interesting, since it seems to involve the cathedus that approaches this eye at the top, meeting it at the catagraphic cut with its isomeric zigzag properties. We might take the face-to-face -face position as adversarial, like Romulus and Remus, and then see the pass-through folded position as related to the palmarium. This thesis is backed up by some interesting legal history. The inner void of the palmarium was by law the only authentic space of the city of Rome. Rome was actually a torus, a bicycle tire, with a pomerium inside. The inhabited space inside the city and the region outside the walls were both regarded as territorial possessions, not the city itself. The move from the face-to-face -face of twins to the 360 panoramic view of the single head 
tells us the story of the foundations of Rome and also explains the logic of the catagraphic cut, which is why Romulus had to plow a double furrow to make the ichnographic plan of Rome before the walls could be built. The Janus fold also would contradict Michel Foucault's model of a uniform disk with a regulating center, radiating power, and control to the periphery, as in Jeremy Bentham's design for the Panopticon. Our model puts all the power in the catagraphic wall itself, with its isomeric interior. The Janus fold is based on the actual history of Roman law, but it also makes us rethink the Panopticon's tower and pay attention to the fact that the tower was negated by the blinds that transferred power to the inmates in the circular wall, whose own catagraphic cut was between their exposure and non-exposure, related to the uncertainty of knowing whether the guards were present or absent. The Panopticon is not a radial design, but a circular one, based on the catagraphic cut dividing visibility from invisibility, all-seeing power from totally blind power. This clicks with representations of justice as both blind and headless. The key to reading these examples is that Justitia, on the right, is a goddess with her head in direct contact with a pure divine ether. So it's invisible below, just as Flammarion space traveler would be if we looked at him from Earth's side. Justitia gives us the reason for saying that the only true space of Rome is the Pomerium, and that visibility of one side from another is impossible, without a legal reason, but that the city on the inside of the circular wall and the territories on the outside are basically equivalent. Just one is contained, the other is uncontained. Rome is a toroid because the torus is also a relation of contained to the uncontained, a little a to the big A justifying, ha ha ha, our account of the Tower of Babel as a gate of heaven, a limincella of Durer. We are well on our way to answering the question Lacan asked in one of his seminars, number seven to be precise, about anamorphic art. Lacan asked, what was anamorphosis before it was anamorphosis? This is the obvious question with anything that is a part of subjectivity's core programming. It may have different forms, but at the level of its circuitry, the same logic applies to whatever different cultural and historical forms the subject must take. With Holbein's double portrait, emphasis on the double here, we get an answer. Before anamorphosis was anamorphosis, it was anamorphitis, a kind of pathology of the symbolic consciousness where the fold in space creates a 2D topology where we can find conatus, cathedus, isometrics, transients, and tessera all bundled together. These symptoms could infect almost any tissue created by culture, any organ the subject needed to breathe, perceive, digest, and love. They are the symptoms of human subjectivity as such. So when we look to this famous portrait painted in 1533, we have a new way to address the blur at the feet of the ambassadors, which looks as if the space of the painting has itself been folded over. Holbein even gives us a version of the Janus fold, using the back of the painting to indicate a date that is weirdly over-precise. Normally, an artist writes the date of completion on the back of a canvas. But in this case, Holbein gives us not just the day, month, and year, but the minute. That doesn't sound right. The key to this mystery comes when we calculate that April 11th, 1533, was Good Friday, the day of the crucifixion. And so we note that the crucifix half hidden at the upper left of the painting was to instruct us to turn the painting over, to see its two sides as two aspects of one surface. The sun would have been exactly 27 degrees above the horizon at 4 p.m. on that Friday in 1533. And this angle is our angle into the mystery painted on the other side. 27 degrees is the exact angle 
that the funny blur at the feet of the two French ambassadors requires us to find and hold, paralyzed as if we were dead, just at the moment we see the blur decode itself. It's a skull, a memento mori, generally speaking, but in the specific instance, it is also a way of holding us directly beneath the crucifix in the spot historically designated as Golgotha, where the skull is explicitly identified as the skull of Adam. This is the point where we trade in everyday truths for a truth of truth, which is about psyche as not just something that is extended into 2D projectivity, but the name of that projectivity itself. Holbein has done this by making a painting that is effectively a thaumatrope, a disc that is spun to combine two images on the opposite sides. Our requirement of paralysis means that we are psychically journeying through hell, suffering a doubling, a chirality, into left and right versions. We have a new figure ground relationship here. Normally, we use figure ground to indicate the way we see something by using parallax to pull it to the front of the scene, and the scene background is pushed into the distance. Here, in Holbein's careful geometric placement of objects in this painting, we see death and life organized around the number nine, which gives us the 27 degrees of the angles and also the precision of the date of the apocalypse when the 4 p.m. sun would be exactly 27 degrees above the London horizon at the moment predicted to be the end of the world. The circle of instruments, books, and navigational devices leaves no doubt that Holbein was relating this instant when all life would be terminated to a spherical geometry where the subtraction of the dimension of time, which is to say paralysis, would come about when the viewer of the painting would be frozen at the point beneath the image where the anamorphic skull would pop into view, a point at a small angle delta away from being totally absorbed by the plane of representation.